Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of West African History and Myths. Today, we will be taking a short look at two specific Igbo myths related to a very light-hearted subject, music and dance. Myth episodes will typically be short and sweet compared to the longer historical episodes. As stated before, but with more emphasis for myths, some stories, even within the same community or tribe, tend to vary. So for you listeners, I will state where exactly the myth comes from. If I can find it, however, you'll be able to know how the differences vary. Even things like a god's gender can be different depending on the locale. As these myths are from the Igbo people, a little bit of information needs to be given about them. This tribe is largely located in southeastern Nigeria, usually around the Niger Delta area and beyond. These days, the tribe has spread out internationally, but southeastern Nigeria is where you will find their ancestral roots. Before I tell you these tales, I must give you a tiny bit of background about the world of Igbos in their myths. This is a world where there are multiple gods of many different aspects of life and of the universe. Spirits dwell in everything, the trees, the rocks, the animals, and even the very air that one breathes. It is a world where humans could spot a god or spirit, just casually walk about, and even visit your town for a quick hello. Not every god or spirit is benevolent. Some are fickle, some are jealous, and some may wish to do you harm. You just need to know the right one to talk to. But when you meet nice gods and spirits, even if you watch them, you can learn a thing or two. This brings us to our first story, coming to us from the region of Asaba in southeast Nigeria. Long ago, when the world was young, and blanketed by thick forests and swelling rivers, the gods and spirits walked freely among men. This did not last long, as man would harass the gods and spirits, begging for favors, to the point that even the spirits of the great trees would lash out at mankind, not wanting to be disturbed. Thus, the gods and spirits would retreat to the heart of the forest, where they would not be contacted by man if they did not want to. But the forest, in those days, was where man got most of the sucker, for even when they planted and harvested crops, as taught to them by the goddess of the harvest, it still took time for the food to grow, so man still needed to hunt. One day, a hunter stole into the forest, chasing after an antelope, when he paused after hearing a strange sound coming from deeper in the forest. He moved in the direction of the sound and came upon a great clearing in the forest, where no trees grew, but there were signs that the grass had been disturbed. Curious, the hunter decided to wait and see what would happen come nightfall. His curiosity was answered as spirits flittered into the clearing. Spirits of wind, spirits of the trees, of the rocks, and of the animals of the forest. Even the leopard king graced the clearing with his presence. 
it was not long before the gods arrived, holding strange items that man had never seen before. These were drums and flutes, and the birds were trilling, making songs, humming, and producing music that the hunter had never heard before. Rhythm began to affect the gods and spirits. They clapped their hands, they began to dance, and soon the forest was filled with song. The hunter, to his surprise, found himself moving in time with the music, mimicking the gods as they danced. Taking care to keep himself hidden, he tried to learn how to sing the songs of the gods and watch how the drums and flutes worked. How he wished to join them, but he would have been an uninvited guest, and that was not a good thing to do with gods. To his sadness, eventually the party ended, and as the gods and spirits left the clearing, the hunter headed home, completely forgetting about the antelope he had been hunting. He found, while on the way home, that he was dancing and humming, while forgetting the words the gods sang, but remembering the melody. When he went back to his village, he called for a meeting in the square, telling the village of what he saw. He ran to his house and grabbed some sticks, hollowed them out, and put holes in them, in the imitation of the very flutes that he saw, and began to play. The people were at first confused, until the hunter's wife found herself humming along to the tune. Then their children, then others in the village, found themselves overcome by dance and music. They added their own words to the melodies and made their own songs and found the music filling their hearts with joy. In time, man would compose hymns and poems of song and spread them to the land of the Ebos, where, full circle, they would play music for the very gods themselves who were delighted that mankind could sing and dance with them. Now wasn't that sweet, but this story has a sequel, but it comes from another part of Igbo lands. We now move up further up the river Niger, not too far from Asaba, but arriving in the lands of the people of Oguta, where we are going to learn about the Owu dance, and its place in Igbo society. While music is known to lift the heart, it can also serve an economic value in Igbo culture, and I don't just mean a paid performance. In the past, there was a man from the village of Omotoguma who spied a pretty woman from Oguta. He courted her, and eventually they fell in love. The problem was that the man had no money to give to her family, nor gifts that he could present them. Without anything to show, the family turned him away. Despondent, he traveled to see the oracle, to ask what he could do to raise enough money to marry the woman that he loved. The oracle acting as a mediator, brought the man before Nka Mo, the spirit of art, who told him that he must entertain his love's parents. Nka Mo took it upon herself to teach the man how to dance perfectly so that he could show sincerity and love through the art of dance itself. It was not a heavy dance, no. It was a dance that was hard to master, for it required the dancer to be serene 
and graceful in all their movements that allowed the very wind, supposedly, to aid in the dance. Satisfied that her student had mastered the dance, Nkaamwa bade the man on his journey. A little tidbit about this dance in real life. It requires a lot of heavy footwork that I'm pretty sure after a few minutes to the average layperson, your feet will be aching sorely. And funny thing about Nkaamwa, there's a certain phrase which I might mess up while recording, but it basically asks if the dancer is actually a spirit or if he's being possessed by a spirit, for no man is supposed to be able to dance like that. Back to the story. The man returned to the family once again, and this time he danced the dance that Nkao Mo had taught him. This dance amazed the family so much, and instead of asking for money as payment for the marriage, they wanted to be taught the dance. The dance itself became so prolific that it was brought before the chieftain, who also wanted to learn the dance himself. Upon learning the dance, the chieftain of Oguta and the visiting chieftains from the surrounding areas institutionalized a program to teach all their citizens the dance itself. Henceforth, in this region of the Igbo lands, money is not used in the marriage ceremony, for the most part, rather, every future son-in-law is expected to be a good dancer, and the Owu dance is now a yearly festival and an essential part of Oguta marriages. If you would like to look up the dance yourselves, please search YouTube for the Owu dance spelled O-W-U so you can see it with your own eyes. I'm sure it'll be worth the short few minutes that it takes. I hope you enjoyed this shorter, more light-hearted mythology episode. In the next episode, we will be leaving Nigeria to visit its neighbor to the west and talk about the famous fighting females of West African history, the inspiration for the Dora Milaje of Black Panther fame, the Dahomey Amazons, and the fight against the French.